You are listening to Literacy, a lecture that is part of the Applied Linguistics program at Macquarie University, taught by Ingrid Piller and part of the Language on the Move network. Today I'm going to take you on a journey back in time, to a time long before smartphones and computers made communication around the globe easy, long even before books, to a time about 5,000 years ago when our ancestors first started to live in cities. That's around the time when agriculture first started and had created surpluses that allowed people to move into cities and to specialize along professions and different roles. The first cities would have looked something like this in the example and the first cities emerged in the, what is currently the Middle East. The city I want to take you to is called Uruk. As you can see from the map, Uruk is located in what is today the Middle East, the area between two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris, also known as Mesopotamia, land between the rivers, and as you can see from the from the map, the fer, known as the Fertile Crescent. It's the floodplain between these two rivers where agriculture, large-scale agriculture first emerged and allowed people to move into cities. Now, let's go to Uruk. Imagine you are the king of Uruk or the head of the temple there, the head priest of the temple there. And one way for you to organize your city is actually to tax the farmers in the area and in return for these taxes you can raise your army, organize the city, organize on the various infrastructure projects. In order to do that you need taxes. You're taxing the farmers around you. Now um, as the city grows People bring in their taxes in terms of, um, let's say, bushels of wheat, corn or animals. That's what they have to bring in once a year. As this goes, it as the city grows, it becomes more and more difficult to keep track of who has paid what. Imagine there is one guy out there who's hiding kind of and you're suspicious that maybe he hasn't really brought in his wheat of corn or um, there's another one who you are trying to force to pay you taxes and says, no, I already paid last year or I already paid five minutes ago, my son paid and so on and so forth. So you can see the lots of disputes that would emerge if you don't have a good record keeping system. And so the problem that presented itself to the head priest in this case, but also to emerging kings in these various cities was actually one of record keeping, to keep track of taxes, to run the, the bureaucratic infrastructure that is needed to run a city. As a solution to this problem, writing emerged. And what you see here in this image is one of the first examples, one of the first known examples of writing that we've got. It's a little clay tablet and um, these various signs that you see in the clay tablet were etched into the clay when it was still soft. Um, it has been discovered in the area around Uruk and dates from around 3000 before the Common Era. There are a couple of things that you can recognize even if you know nothing about this particular script. And um, one of the things that's really easy to recognize is obviously the corns or the, the, the ears of corn or wheat. So what we know about the sign is that it's actually, um, or this clay tablet, this first piece of writing, it's actually um, a tax record of who had paid what. 
So writing emerged as a problem, as a solution to a bureaucratic problem. And it's not only in Mesopotamia that writing emerged as a solution to a bureaucratic problem. The same is true at another place in the world in the Inca Empire. Let's now move on to the Incas. This slide shows you a map of the Incan Empire. As you can see, it's located in South America and um, the various colors in the Inca Empire. So um, the whole yellow extension is the largest expanse of the Inca Empire in the 15th century. But where I really want to take you is to the capital of the Impa Inca Empire, right in the Red Heart, the city of Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu, also an early urban city, similar problems as I just described to you for Uruk in Mesopotamia. And just like the Sumerian kings and head priests, um, the king of the Inca Empire was concerned with actually making sure that he knew how to administer his large empire. Um, so he was interested in knowing how many people there were in various parts of the empire, how much there was in terms of arable fields, how many cattle and animals these people had. And so the Incas came up with another intriguing solution to um, exactly the same problem that the Sumerians had. Instead of um, writing on etching signs into clay, they actually used strings to tie them into knots. What you see here is an Inca kipur, or a talking knot, as it's also called in English. Um, the various types of knots, the various length of string, the various colors of the string, all provide information and encode information such as, as I said earlier, about how many people there are in a particular area, how much land they have, how much livestock they have, how many troops there are in the army, what kind of equipment they have, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, we actually know very little about um, how to use these Kipu and to fully decipher them. Very few of them survive. That few of these survive is maybe not so surprising because textile, textiles, of course, are not a very durable product. However, um, the whole chain of transmission has been lost. It was lost during colonization from the 60s during the Spanish colonization of Latin America from the 16th century onwards. And so um, today we really have lost both the products and the transmission. Also, uh, although apparently some shepherds in the Andes mountains still use very simple forms of these um, kipus to actually keep track of the number of their sheep and the number of their flock and that kind of thing. Whether these Inca kipu are actually a form of writing or not is um, heavily debated. Most scholars would argue that it's not writing, that it is not language specific, but um, a non-linguistic code. However, um, we actually don't know enough about these particular types of writing. And given that their, their tradition was so abruptly interrupted with colonization, we really need to treat that as an open question. The reason I'm showing you these kipu, similarly to um, the clay tablets, was mostly to um, bring home to you that writing emerged as a problem that emerged with human urbanization, that emerged with complex social societies, the problem of record keeping and information storage. So let's pause here and recap. Why was writing invented? 
Well, let me tell you why it was not invented. Writing was certainly not invented to be an alternative visual medium for spoken language. So the intention of the first writers was had very little to do with um, recording spoken language. They knew how to handle spoken language. What they wanted to achieve was record keeping. They wanted to create an information technology. So early writing is really more like an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, than um, a poem or a novel. So the key point, the, the key reasons for the invention of writing was um, state administration and bureaucracy, as I've shown to you, but also trade and commerce, particularly along large, uh, longer distances and um, religion, again, tied to bureaucracy. So overall, the key point to keep in mind is that writing emerged as a power tool. It is essential to social organization. And although we've come a really long way with the development of writing and contemporary writing is so is vastly different from the writing, the first beginnings of writing about 5000 years ago, writing continues to be essential to our social organization. So now it's time to ask who invented writing? Well, it's a difficult question and only one thing is for sure. There wasn't one single inventor, like some genius who invented writing. Writing was invented collaboratively by a number of people working in an urban environment. The other thing we can say for sure is that it was invented a couple of times by different civilizations. We can say for sure that it was invented independently at least three times. It may have been invented many more times. The reason we don't know exactly how often writing was invented, um, there are three reasons for that. First one, um, we cannot always be sure how various writing traditions and scripts are related to each other. For instance, there is a debate around um, Egyptian hieroglyphs, whether they were an independent invention of writing in Egypt or whether they actually related in one way or another as some sort of copy or were inspired by the Sumerians in Mesopotamia. The second reason we can't be sure how often writing was invented is that we have an incomplete record. Um, many forms of writing decay and may never have been discovered. I already mentioned to you that the textiles that were used for um, the talking knots decay easily. The same is true of writing on bark, on paper, all these materials disappear quite quickly. So um, it's particularly traditions that actually carved their writing in stone or produced very durable material as also the clay tablets that are well known and where we have a good record. The third reason why we can't be absolutely sure how often writing was invented is that there actually is a debate around what constitutes writing. As I told you, many there is this debate, does uh, do the Inca talking knots um, constitute a form of writing or not? I said um, most scholars agree that it is not really a fully fledged writing system. But we actually don't know enough to be able to make these distinctions. So um, what we are sure is that language specific writing, writing that encodes a particular language and is a script for a particular language emerged at least three times. As I told you in Mesopotamia, that's the, where we have the earliest records um, there written records date back to around 3400 before the common era. The second independent tradition is in China where the earliest records date back to one th around 1200 before the common era. And the third independent tradition is in Mesoamerica 
the Mayan culture in what is today Mexico, Guatemala, and um, their writing dates back or the evidence that we have dates back to around 300 before the Common Era. Of these three writing systems that emerged independently, only one is a continuing tradition, and that's the Chinese script. The um, other two, have, transmission has been lost, has died out, um, faded into other writing systems. So let's now turn to the one continuing script tradition, the Chinese script. The earliest evidence that we have for um, Chinese writing dates from the Shang Dynasty. The Shang Dynasty is around 1600 to 1046 before the Common Era. And um, the writing evidence that we have are the so-called Shang Oracle Bones. Oracle Bones are um, either bones from the shoulder blades of oxen or turtle shells. And these bones or shells were scraped and then writing was scratched into them. These oracle bones were used for divination to foretell the future. Something Again, something that humans have been invested in um, throughout all our known history. The typical inscription pattern on one of these oracle bones includes four elements. A preface, the preface gives, gives the date, the name of the diviner and the name of the questioner. It includes a charge, that's the topic of the question and the specific question. So something like, um, when should I bring my sheep to market? When will I get the best profit? Or when's a good date for an auspicious wedding? Or will my wife have children? Will it be a boy or a girl? Then there is the prognostication. That's the answer provided by the spirit. And um, the verification is added later on. The way this worked basically was that someone who wanted to know the future went to see a diviner and um, the diviner would scratch the date, his or her name and the name of the questioner onto one of those bones. And they would also write down the topic of the question and the specific question. And then they would um, somehow smash the bone so that cracks appeared. And the cracks were then read by the diviner as providing a particular answer. And that answer was thought to come from the spirit. So something like, um, yeah, bring your sheep to market next Wednesday and you will have a good profit. And then the verification comes in at a later date when um, it says something like, yeah, the sheep were sold on that such and such a date and um, the questioner received a nice profit. Now that we know why writing was invented and who invented it, let's see how they went about it. Well, all writing starts with images, with pictograms, images of the concrete world, of concrete objects, like in the um, example of the early cuneiform tablets that I showed you, the corn ears, or in the example that you're looking at here, an image of the horse. This image of the horse appears in exactly this form, except standing on its tail for some reason, on the Shang oracle bones. A bit later in the written record of the Chinese script, we see this image of a horse. I think in the first example, you know, the image is really clear. You have 
the head of the horse, you have the ears, you have an eye, you have the four lines that characterize the mane, you have the body and um, the legs, and you have a little tail. Now, by the time we meet this fairly concrete image, um, later in the evolution of Chinese writing, it has been abstracted quite a bit. You wouldn't recognize this image down there in the bottom left hand side of your slide as a horse if you didn't see this red line that I'm showing you. With the red line you actually can see, oh, okay, how how they got from the horse above to the horse in quotation mark below. So the head is still there, the eye is still there, the three lines that characterize the mane is still there, the legs are still there and the tail is still there. A couple of years later, a couple of decades, centuries later, we encounter this sign, still the sign for horse, further abstracted. And um, now that you know that this is an abstraction of an image for a horse, you can actually see it again. So the mane is still there, the legs are still there, and the tail is still there. And next time we encounter this sign is actually in the contemporary Chinese character for horse. There are two of them because um, Chinese script exists in two forms. The form that we call the traditional script that's used in Taiwan and Hong Kong and um, the one in the right hand side, the simplified script that's used in the mainland of China. Um, if you look at the contemporary signs for horse, there is really nothing that gives you the image of the horse. So we see a th thousands of years of abstraction, but we can kind of retrace the steps to the original image of the horse. And that's actually how all writing started. It started with concrete Im images of concrete objects, drawings of those objects, pictograms. Let me give you another example of a pictogram that um, became a letter. This time, not from the Chinese script, but from the Egyptian hieroglyphs. So what you see here is an image from Egyptian writing from 3000 before the Common Era, clearly an oxen's head. So you can see, or once I've told you that it's the image of the head of an oxen, you can see um, the eye, you can see the horns, you can see the ear. Now this image of the oxen has been abstracted to become the first letter of our alphabet. And let me show you how that worked. Um, uh, a thousand years later after, we have this fairly concrete image um, used by the Egyptians in the Sinai script. We see an abstraction of the horse head. So writing, of course, needed to be fast, needed to be efficient. So the abstraction that you have here is basically the eye and the ear has been left out. But you can still recognize that this is the head of an oxen as long as you know where it came from. A um, couple of centuries later, what we encounter is the Phoenician alphabet. By now, the abstraction is really three lines that have been brought together and there is no similar, I mean, there's still a bit of a similarity, but only if you know to look for that similarity. Otherwise, the abstraction now is at such a high level that um, you can no longer really go back to the oxen image. And then the Romans put this, um, changed this around a bit, and this gives us the letter A that we still use today in um, the Latin alphabet that's used in so many languages, including English, of course. So a nice story of abstraction, and that's the key principle. These two examples of the Chinese character for horse and um, the Egyptian to Latin from image to letter, oxen to A, um, that I'm trying to show to you here. So 
we start with concrete images and um, we abstract from it until we get a sign that has lost all trace of the original image. So the general process of how writing started, how it was invented that I've just outlined to you, starts with an image of a concrete object, a pictogram, and then we see a process of abstraction that turns that image into a sign that is no longer recognizably related to the original image. However, as you can easily see, the problem with that is that if this process sort of is the only process we have, then um, all we can ever write about in our writing system are concrete objects. So you can easily see how an ear of corn gets started, how a horse gets started, or how the sign for horse gets started, how the sign for head of oxen gets started, how the sign for head in this example gets started. But then you run into problems because there are many things that are really difficult to draw. And this is true of small or large abstract objects, uh, concrete objects, and it's also true of abstract objects so it becomes really quite complicated. Let me show you how complicated it got for the Sumerians with the example of the head. So around 3000 before the Common Era in Sumerian proto-cuneiform, so a very early form that still has the signs sort of in the, 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 the pictograms intact, we see this image of a head. And um, then once they had the sign for head in place, the Sumerians needed a sign for mouth. And they quite cleverly added two little lines to the image for head in the position where um, the mouth is located, you know, on a head. Then they wanted a sign for tooth. Oops, same thing. Then they wanted a sign for word, same thing. Then they wanted a sign for voice, same thing. Then they wanted a sign for to speak, same sign. So you can see that the first and most important strategy that I've outlined to you to start from a pictogram, from an image of a concrete object, really doesn't go all that far once we, re once we try to um, describe or find signs for more complex concepts. To solve the problem of how to um, turn the signs for concrete objects into something more abstract, a really nifty little principle has been used. It's the Rebus principle. And let me give you an example how the Rebus principle works. Um, I'm sure all of you can decode this little riddle, although it's not, um, you know, it's not writing. So we have um, a sign for I, heart, and you, and this gives us I love you. Although this looks like three pictograms that have been put together, it's actually highly abstract in the sense that an image has been associated, an image of a concrete object has been associated with a sound in the case of I and you, and um, an image of a concrete object has been associated with an abstract concept in the case of heart. Now, notice that although we have three images, and this should theoretically work language independently, the Rebus principle does not work language independently. The, um, this collection, I love you, only works in English because only in English the image of an I actually has the same sound as I and the same is true for the you and um, the heart meaning, the meaning relationship may be a bit more universal. But so the Rebus principle means to associate the image of a concrete object either with a sound or with an abstract meaning. And as I said, this only works language independently. 
Let me give you another example of this connection between signs and sounds with um, an example from Chinese. What you've got here is the character for mother pronounced ma. And this character is broken up, can be broken up into two elements. And um, the first element is the um, character for woman, nu. And um, the second one is the character for horse that we already encountered earlier. Now, you would wonder why is why why does the sign woman horse horse woman become the sign for mother doesn't make sense there is really no connection between a mother and a horse is there well no there isn't if you only look at the meaning however look at the pronunciation the pronunciation of horse ma is with the difference in tone, the same one as the pronunciation for the word mother. So what the character actually tells us is that this is a woman that is pronounced like the word for horse. And so um, these, making these really clever association between various signs and sounds and meaning is how writing systems, how scripts developed. And um, each and every script consists of uncountable of such really clever invention that someone back, you know, millennia ago made and um, produced a little riddle for us. Nowadays, of course, we don't really need to know how of the, the original meanings, but it's really intriguing to see how clever our ancestors were as they came about conventionalizing the relationship between what originally were images of concrete objects and the highly abstract writing systems that we are familiar with today and that we use today. So just to recap, the overall process of the modification of pictograms works um, by first pictograms lose their visual connection. So um, there really is no connection anymore between the image of a horse and the horse sign in Chinese or um, between the head of an oxen and the letter A. Um, in a next step, signs come to represent no longer those concrete objects. So the, this character here, um, the horse character or um, the letter A, no longer has anything to do with a horse or with an ox. Rather, the signs come to represent, and that's the principle of writing, they come to represent not those concrete objects, not ideas, but words or sounds. And these are different types of um, writing systems, whether they do one or the other. Of course, there is overlap, as is usually the case. So there is a continuum. I've put words and sounds in quotation marks because words and sounds are actually, um, they are everyday words for something that linguists like to be a bit more specific about words and sound. There is a whole theoretical discussion about what actually is a word and the sound. So the technical term that I've given you in brackets, morphemes and phonemes, they are not equivalent to either words or sounds, but they are the technical terms in the sense that if we want to be more precise, then we could use signs either represent morphemes or phonemes. And that would mean a morpheme is defined as the smallest unit in a language that carries meaning. Horse is such a smallest unit. And a, a phoneme is the smallest unit in a language that distinguishes meaning. So um, the letter, the, the sound A is a phoneme of English. Um, without going into too much details here, the key point I want you to remember is that once the pictograms have lost their visual connection and have become signs, these signs then can be used language specifically to represent either words. And then we have a logographic script 
or they come to represent sounds and then we have a syllabary or an alphabet. So um, that's how the two major types of writing systems in the world came to be and that's essentially how all writing that we know of came into existence. Now an example of a logographic script is the Chinese script. An example of an alphabetic script is um, the Roman alphabet. And that's it for today. Just to quickly recap, writing was invented millennia ago as humans first started to live in complex societies in urbanizing societies, so writing is a tool of social organization. Writing was invented a couple of times around the world by various different civilizations, and the way it was invented is by originally drawing images of concrete objects and over the time associating them, turning them into signs and associating them either with words or sounds. I hope I'm leaving you with a deep sense of awe for those fantastic inventors thousands of years ago, whose hard work and ingenuity allows us to read the text on this slide, for instance, in the blink of an eye and to enjoy the incredible benefits to humanity of our ability to read and write.